every time I make a film, I try to enjoy the process as though it's an experiment and to learn as much as I can about the movie making process and also of the movie making process as it now is practiced in modern time where we have uh, video and uh, electronics uh, to be able to, you know, to actually to make the film in an electronic environment. So one concept I had is the idea that a movie uh, could exist as an armature in which you would basically have the whole movie there but not with the actual elements in their final form but you could still weigh and and see and judge the structure and the effect and uh, uh, how how the thing more or less appeared to you and then gradually as you went on to each layer as you cast it you could start superimposing or adding to this kind of multi-layered uh, armature of the pictures of the actors and then see it and you'd actually see those personalities and then after you rehearsed you could put in those rehearsals and it was sort of like, as though a film is a, uh, a patchwork or a quilt of these elements each one uh, in a, a new level of refinement until finally at the last phase is the actual movie. In the scene when Dracula appeared he had to be on some sort of a rig that would pull him into the room and and this shot of him throwing the girl up on the roof had to be a gravity shot. That means the set had to be built in reverse so, so that you, you, every time you tried to do anything, it required you know, time to set it up and to figure out how to do it. Fortunately, we had the storyboard, so we knew more or less what the shots would be, so we weren't figuring that out. We had already figured that out. But even to execute it in a Hollywood studio, which is probably the most expensive place to shoot in the world, um, uh, I guess one of my big problems as a director is that I tend to want to do everything and and um, be ambitious in what scope I set. And then to really do it uh, takes time. And, and to do all this in 69 days began to make my job more about how do I do it uh, economically and get it really done uh, rather than uh, just thinking about, oh, how I want to direct the actors or something. The storm was made out of a lot of little fragments and pieces, uh, and we cut actually building the boat out of the movie, so all we had was like the sails or the things that we could project on the sails. And I had felt that although the boat sequence is wonderful, it was done very well in other movies, and we had so much to tell that uh, I just kind of opted to not... Uh, you know, just do that sequence again that had been done well, and I did it in my own way. You see, it's all just fragments and water splashing on a rope, but when you really look at it, there's nothing nothing on the screen but just little simple elements that I didn't have the boat, basically. I also was trying to imply that the storm on the boat was like kind of going to come to England and so on, even in the camera movement in the asylum and in the gardens is moving as though it's on a boat. Well, right in the beginning, I wanted the costumes to be the focal point of the production design because, number one, I thought that was unusual. Normally, it's not the case. Normally, the sets dominate everything. Also, I thought that the beautiful costumes and fabric are very much, uh, very, very sensual. Also, they are the element closest to the actors, and I felt that it was our actor that was our, 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 our jewels, you know. So, and also uh, for economic reasons, if I had to build sixty enormous sets, it was clear that it was going to be very, you know, those kind of that kind of construction could really be a big tax on the movie. Not only because the sets themselves are expensive, but because it's expensive in the amount of stagehands and people and the, just the amount of stages, just the body of the film becomes so big and unwieldy that I didn't want to get in that trap. So I I kept trying to focus our energy and our priorities to the costumes. But then if that were the case, the costumes would have to be very unusual. So I went to designers, I considered designers that I thought would be capable of coming up with something very unusual and yet appropriate for the style of the film. And I knew Eiko Ishioka from, from some of the work she did on the graphics in Apocalypse uh, advertising and also work she did on Paul Schrader's movie Mishima. So, and I had worked with her on some little things, and I thought she was a very original and creative person. So, although it was a big risk because she had never done costumes and she was certainly not in the studio roster of people that they could feel comfortable working 
for, but that was also a plus because I felt she would be much more likely to take my lead in terms of coming up with something really that had never been sun, uh, seen before uh, rather than a lot of sometimes studio people tend to repeat the way they do things for other films and you you find it's very hard to make a, a film with an original look or with an original take because the very uh, heads of departments themselves tend to not want to be embarrassed in front of their peers so they tend to be they tend to always give you what they give everyone else and I know that wouldn't happen with Aiko. The reviews the film got were pretty much the way all my films are reviewed. I mean, I, they're always astonished to say, oh, well, the film was, uh, you know, got people who thought it was great and people thought it was terrible, but I have never made a film that didn't get those kind of reviews. You can just go back and look at Apocalypse Now or even The Godfather for that matter. And traditionally, the people in Europe and around the world who are more adventurous with what they expect from a film uh, pretty unanimously loved it, and, and it made a ton of money in both places, but even more so uh, in Europe because the critics also thought it was uh, unique. It really comes down to what you want from a movie. Uh, in, I, when I go to a movie, I'd like to see something that's daring and that I've never seen before, and that tends to set new norms and new standards and uh, change how we look at films. But in the United States uh, and, and the critical establishment here as well as the studio heads, they tend to like movies that are like the other movies they've already seen and like and they feel more secure in saying a movie is good if it's very much like a movie that they thought was good. And it's just a different way of, of viewing things. Obviously, if you only could make films according to the past films, all your cinema would be basically uh, rehashed old movies, which is pretty much what they do in Hollywood. The movie came out and they were already bum wrapping the picture before we, you know, it just shows how, how really phony it is, you know, that they don't really, in the end, five years from now, they'll say, oh, what a great movie, how unusual and stuff. And yet they don't give you a break when you need their support, which is when you're trying to argue with the studio to let you go on instead of having the attitude of, yeah, try it, try it, make it unusual, do it, do it, do something we haven't seen before. It's really, they're, they're really in the end, criticizing you because you're not doing the way they would have seen it. When you make a movie, you always try to find a, a take on the subject matter and that that take, whatever it may be, usually uh, becomes your discipline as to, as to how you're going to approach all the decisions that you make. A director is basically a decision-making machine and he has to uh, give decisions on to how you're going to do everything. And I like to have a at least a rationale or a concept, and my concept was to make the film in the spirit, spirit of the early cinema, and, which was partly created by magicians. I think a little bit that the Academy Award is sort of like the Nobel Prizes. People get so crazy about getting one, and department heads get so, you know, so obsessed with doing it that they really, in a way, tend to not serve the common, you know, the common goal that like the scientists are all out there trying to win the Nobel Prize and so they're very competitive with one another and they don't end up coming up with a cure you know and the same thing in the film is that you really can sense when the departments like have their eye on that more than they do on, on what the movie is really supposed to be doing I was very fortunate in that I won a lot of Oscars when I was young and so I don't have that obsessive uh, need that that some folks I've met have, you know, that they're getting old and they really want to have one.